Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. You're very gracious. Thank you. I know I'm doing all right when the band stands. Thank you, gentlemen. You know, uh, I say to the parents and grandparents and siblings, uh, you'd think Syracuse would have learned by now. This is the fifth time Biden has addressed the commencement. I guess it's trouble getting anybody else to come. I, it's a great honor to be invited back. Dean Banks, uh, thank you, not for the introduction, but for your friendship. And to the faculty and staff, thank you for your service to this great institution. I mean that sincerely. To the chagrin of some of my professors, I actually taught for 21 years at Delaware Law School, uh, an advanced course in constitutional law and separation of powers. And uh, so I would not be accused of having any conflict. I taught it on Saturday mornings. It was a three-hour course, three-credit course. And it satisfied for the writing requirement. And even though I literally wrote the manuscript because I had some considerable experience in separation of powers and with the help of Dean Banks and as chairman of the judiciary of the both Judiciary and Foreign Relations Committee, I, there wasn't a single class I taught, and I did it for 19 years, that I didn't spend three hours preparing, either the night before or up early in that morning. So uh, my wife's a professor. She uh, is a doctor at, uh, she has her doctorate. She teaches at a community college. and. Uh, um, the job thinking that maybe I wasn't going to, and this was 20 years ago, and I might want to teach. But I realized you really have to work, and my day job was better. Um, <laughs> but thank you for your dedication. I really mean it. I genuinely, genuinely mean it. And the class of 2016, by far, before I talk about you guys, I want to talk a little bit about those folks behind you. Be nice to them. You may need them to pay off your college, your law school loans. You may need their help. The parents and grandparents and spouses, all who helped, it is an enormous sacrifice, an enormous cost uh, to get a graduate degree at any institution, a law degree at any institution. And uh, I, uh, I, I, I know you'll all, you all believe today that whatever part you played in that effort was worth it. Because uh, as my dad would say, who never went to college, I'd ask him all the time why he thought it was so important I get a college degree and a law degree. He said, because they can never take it from you. I never fully understood that until I got older and realized what my father said, which was what you've learned, what you know, both uh, equips you but also prevents you from rationalizing about things you might otherwise want to do that are easier. And so I say to the class of 2016, uh, um, you made it. 11 of winter and two weeks of fall and two weeks of spring. Uh, I remember. Uh, I remember I told Dean this. I, I don't want to, I guess I shouldn't start telling stories because it'll take too long, but my son, Bo, who was my soul, my son, Bo, I talked to him every single day. And uh, he called me his senior year. It was April the 13th. I used to always brag about, tell my kids a story about the blizzard of 66, 60 inches of snow here in Syracuse for real, 100 inches at Watertown. And I'd tell my kids and then my grandkids that story. So October the 13th, Early in the morning, I got a call from my son. He never called in the morning. I said, what's the matter, honey? He said, no, nothing, Dad. I just walked up from Genesee. He said, uh, he said I, uh, I just want you to know it's April 13th. It was Friday, April 13th. I thought he was going to make some joke about it being unlucky. I said, you know everything unlucky for everyone else is lucky for Biden's? And he said, yeah, Dad, but he said, it's April 13th. They just announced I'm in the law school lounge. 13 inches of snow has fallen today. And then he said, and they announced, Dad, that more snow has fallen this year than any time in recorded history. I think it was 198 inches. Don't hold me to the number. And then he said, Dad, 
I now own the snow stories. <laughs> so not only did you make it through the winter, you climbed out of the dungeon into the Neen Hall, you actually have sunlight, no more wheel of terror, no more nightmares. Professor Lampe would, uh, Lampe would be calling on you in class. <laughs> I had uh, a similar experience with a professor named Alexander, who was my torch professor. Because I was a scholarship student, I got to take role and sat all the way in the back. No one was ever absent. Uh, and, uh, um, and everybody dreaded being called on by Professor Alexander. And uh, I had not prepared all that well. As a matter of fact, I'm embarrassed to say I hadn't even bought, purchased the book yet. And uh, I was in the back of class, and I had a great friend named Clayton Hale, who lived here as a lawyer here, a brilliant guy, who I'd always be able to borrow Clay's notes on the way home. And, uh, and so uh, he called on me. I didn't know, I hadn't read the case. I stood up and I gave a 10 minutes exposition on the case. And when I finished, the entire class stood and applauded. And the president of the the guy who graduated at number one in our class, wanted to become the managing partner of Sullivan Cromwell, said, uh, um, reminded everyone when he supported me running for president, he said, and the professor looked at Biden and said, you know, Mr. Biden, you'll probably become a very good advocate. It's obvious you don't know a damn thing you're saying, but you spellbound the class for 10 minutes. That sort of summarizes my career at Syracuse. I, uh, but it's a genuine, it's a true story, unfortunately. He went on to be dean of a law school on the West Coast. It's a genuine honor to be back at a place I love. A law school where I made incredible friends who have lasted my whole life, including my best friend, Jack Owens, who ended up becoming my law partner and then my brother-in-law. Bob Osgood, Don Parsons, Clay Hale, Eddie Moses, Joe Watt, John Cavino, Don McNaughton, who named the uh, facility after his mom, and so many others. This law school educated and stood by me throughout my career. Professor Tom Maroney, I don't know, I told he may be here, one of the finest guys I've ever known. And where are you, Tom? Stand up, man. Stand up. Professor's not only a man of great integrity, he convinced me that I could be whatever I wanted to be. The only reason anybody ever questioned his judgment is he gave me an A in his course. Uh, and uh, guys like Sam Donnelly, who taught here for 42 years or 44 years, who we lost last year, a Dean Karras, a Dean Miller, too many others to mention. Uh, they uh, did everything for me. They helped me. Dean Miller's, uh, I, uh, they helped me get my first job in the law. I'll never forget the concluding line in Dean Miller's recommendation letter he wrote to me. I'm serious, it said, you'll be indeed fortunate if you get Mr. Biden to work for you. Um, he never lied. Um, my classmates and my professors literally helped me get elected to the United States Senate at age 29. I was not able to be sworn in uh, until uh, I was uh, until legally 13 days later. This school, this law school, my faculty, my friends, embraced me with open arms when, six weeks later after being elected, my wife and daughter were killed when a tractor trailer broadsided them and my two sons were not expected to live. They were with me. When I announced I wasn't going to be sworn in, two of my professors came to see me, encouraging me, telling me there are only 1,720 people in American history who had ever been elected to the United States Senate, and I had an obligation to my wife and my family because they worked so hard. The 
The fact is that um, when I launched my first presidential bid in 1988, a number of my colleagues and a couple of professors actually drove to Wilmington and got on the train and rode with me to my — they were there with my announcement as I announced in Wilmington and rode with me to Washington as I announced on the national stage as well. They uh, embraced me. And they embraced me when I lost, as if I had won, as if I had won. They supported me in uh, seven winning campaigns for the United States Senate and two as vice president. The type of loyalty that this school has extended to me is truly rare and genuinely welcoming. It was the same for my, my son, Bo, who loves Syracuse as well. You embraced him when he enrolled here, not as a senator's son, but as Bo Biden on his own terms. You prepared him to be a great lawyer, which he was, and a young attorney general, two terms. He made great friends here, as I did. George, the two Chris's, Andy, Joe, Lisa Marie, Natalie. Actually, he had an advantage over me. Half his class, like this class, was women. We only had one woman in our graduating class. And the profession is so much better off now. The bench is so much more competent now. And the school is so much better now. Some of you may think I'm engaging in hyperbole when I talk about the loyalty. But Bo's friends were there when, as a sitting attorney general, he sought an exception to be able to go with his National Guard unit to Iraq. They literally were there and saw him off when he volunteered to deploy as the Army Brigade Trial Council. And after a year in Iraq, when he came home, as a proud veteran, having been awarded the Bronze Star, the Legion of Merit, the Delaware Conspicuous Service Cross, his law school friends were literally there when he disembarked. They stayed in contact with him when three years ago he was diagnosed with a death sentence of stage four glioblastoma of the brain. They visited him in whatever hospital he was in, whether it was in Texas at one of the great cancer hospitals or at Jefferson in Philadelphia or at Walter Reed at the end. I'm still there, looking out for my Bo's children, Natalie and Hunter, and his wife, Hallie. And Dean, the school continues to look out for my boy's memory honoring him today, honoring him today, the scholarship named after him. The affection for Syracuse Law School runs deep in the Biden family. Two generations approaching three. Dean Banks, on behalf of my son Hunter, who made a mistake and went to Yale Law School, my daughter, Ashley, my wife, Jill, Bo's wife, Hallie, his children, Natalie and Hunter, we are indebted to Syracuse, not only for the support, but the affection it's shown and continues to show to my Bo. It would mean a lot to Bo knowing that a deserving student will be able to attend this great law school on a scholarship that has his name attached to it. And those of you who knew him in the audience know I mean that. He would have been proud. He was a good man. He was the finest person I've ever known in my life. In the class of 2016, you're a remarkable class. The best of your generation in a remarkable generation. Again, that's not hyperbole. Your generation is the most tolerant, 
generation ever. And with the intellectual horsepower and the tools to be able to make things happen, to get things done. And now, as you sit there, many of you have or are in the process of deciding, what will you do with all this capability? Like all of you, when I graduated, I felt a similar pressure. What will I do? But the script was written, find the best job with the most prestigious law firm you can. Be in a position to advance, to make good money, become a partner. That's what I did. I landed a job because of the help of my professors with one of the most prestigious law firms in my state, one of the oldest in my state. But the problem was, as I strode across the stage in 1968, the world had changed. Dr. King had been assassinated. There were riots throughout America. A significant part of my hometown of Wilmington, Delaware, was burned to the ground. We became the only city since Reconstruction to be occupied by the military for nine months. The National Guard in every corner with drawn bayonets, state troopers patrolling the neighborhood, not city cops. And I was home with a prestigious job. Because wasn't that what I was supposed to do? Wasn't that what I expected to do? But six months later, I realized that wasn't what I was supposed to do. And to the surprise of the senior partners in my law firm, I walked out of a federal courtroom, catty corner across what they call Rodney Square, the center of town, into the basement of the building on the far corner. And I walked into the public defender's office. And I asked for a job. Remember the guy holding, directing the office, and his name was Franny Kearns. He said, aren't you with? And I said, yes. He said, you're making a big mistake. But like many of your parents, I was lucky just in time. I learned early on what I wanted to do, what made me the happiest. Family faith, being engaged in the public affairs that gripped my generation when I graduated. The civil rights movement, the environmental movement, the women's movement, ending a bitterly divisive war in Vietnam. Now it's your turn. It's your time. Time to attempt to find that sweet spot where success and happiness intersect. And it's not easy. Some of you will go into uh, and onto powerful law firms on Wall Street, government service, prosecutor's office, public defenders. Some of you will take the knowledge and be successful entrepreneurs representing and represent nonprofits. Some of you will serve in the military. Some of you will go back to your home countries and risk, risk your lives for the rule of law. But all of you will have one thing in common. You'll all have to figure out how to balance success, happiness, and ambition. I've met an awful lot of successful people. I've literally met every major world leader in the last 42 years. Personally met them. So many others. People who by any standard are considered success. But I've observed, as I've gotten to know many of them, a significant number of them are not happy. I've worked with eight presidents. Only 13 senators have served longer than me in the entirety of American history. Industry leaders, 
the psychons of Silicon Valley, high-powered lawyers, doctors, nurses, teachers, social workers. And I made several basic observations that I hope will help you. Those who I observed who achieved both success and happiness, those who balanced life and career, those who found purpose and fulfillment, they all understood that there's no silver bullet, no single formula, no reductive list. They all seem to understand that success and happiness do not result from a single thing. They result from an accumulation of thousands of little things with the common feature that they built their character. First, the successful and happy people I've come to know understand that a good life at its core is about being personal being engaged. It's being there for a friend or colleague when they sustain an injury in an accident, remembering to congratulate them on a marriage or birth, being available to them as they're going through personal loss or failure. It's about loving somebody more than you love yourself. It seems to all get down to personal. That's the stuff that fosters relationships and the only stuff that breeds trust in everything you do in life. The way you earn trust. And I mean earn trust. So try to look beyond the character, caricature of a person. Resist the temptation to ascribe motive because the truth is you never know a person's motive. And if you ascribe motive, it makes it incredibly difficult in ever establishing, to establish a relationship. It gets in the way. Resist the temptation to let network be a verb that saps the personal away, that blinds you to the person right in front of you their hopes, their fears, their burdens. Build real relationships, even with people with whom you vehemently disagree. I promise you will not only be happier for it, you will be more successful. Second thing I've observed, they all believe although no one is better than them, Everyone is their equal and entitled to be treated with dignity and respect, regardless of their academic or social backgrounds. Think of the people you know who respond to pedigree, who respond to social standing. I've noticed that the ones who had the most success and were most respected were the ones who never confused academic credentials and social sophistication with gravitas or judgment. You know a lot of people who are incredibly bright who lack judgment. They do not necessarily go together. And don't forget about what does not come with your LLM or your JD. And that is the heart to know what is meaningful and what is ephemeral. And the head to know the difference between knowledge and judgment. The third thing in my experience they all seem to have in common is that they have resisted the temptation to rationalize. My chief of staff and later United States Senator Ted Kaufman, a graduate of the Wharton School, a brilliant guy. Every new employee we'd hire, the last thing he'd say to them, never underestimate the ability of the human mind to rationalize. 
to end up with the ends justifying the means. Ladies and gentlemen, I've seen, as your parents have and you have, so many people rationalize in the name of ambition. Her birthday really doesn't matter that much to her. This business trip is really important. It would be better for both of us. I know this is the last game, but in order to make it, I'd have to take Red Eye back and he'll understand. We can always take that vacation another time, the one I promised and we planned for six months. Because I have an important project to finish. You know it. You do it. Some of you have seen your parents do it. And resist the temptation or rationalize what others view as the right choice for you instead of what you know is right, what feels right, what feels right in your gut based on what's important to you. Let that be your North Star. As I've said at other graduations this year, I know your generation faces an incredible amount of pressure to succeed now that you've accomplished so much. Your whole generation faces the same pressure. It's a remarkable generation. You race to do what, other think, do what others think is the right thing in high school, the right courses to take. You race through the blood sport of college admissions and law school admissions. You race to Syracuse Law ready for the next big thing. And I know you'll be re reluctant to admit it, but along the way, you compare yourself to the success of your peers on Facebook, Instagram, Lycan, Twitter. Today, some of you may have found that you've slipped into that self-referential bubble that validates certain choices. The bubble that expands once you leave campus, the pressure and anxiousness as well. Take a certain job, live in a certain place, hang out, hang out with the same kind of people. And for God's sake, don't take a real risk that could impact on your career. All the time while getting paid for the false sense of both. You have the intellectual horsepower to make things better in the world around you. As I said, you're the most tolerant generation in American history. But intellectual horsepower and tolerance alone do not make a generation great. Unless you can break out of that bubble of your own making technologically, geographically, racially, socioeconomically, truly connect with the world around you. Some of you rationalize you don't need to be engaged. But you can't cordon yourself off from the effects of climate change. When your brother is not allowed to marry the man he loves, you are diminished. You know, I think, and I'm not just saying this, I think my son Bo said it best when he was the commencement speaker here as Attorney General in 2011. He said, and I quote, be the guardians of a more complicated truth. That means are as important and sometimes even more important than the ends. He went on to say, you will be lawyers in your profession, but now, Knowing what you know, you will also be leaders in your communities and among your friends and families. In those more private, yet equally challenging courtrooms, 
you will face a similar cycle of testing and retesting. You know what I'm to say? And you will find peace when there are certain rules that you conclude are not malleable. Your conscience, for one. Your conscience should not be malleable. Your values, for another. They are your means. And along with learning, you now possess these and other things that will guide you. End of quote. He believed as I do, that you can find balance between ambition and what's really important. You can do both. You can absolutely succeed in life without ever sacrificing your ideals or your commitments to others and family. Heed the words of Justice Brandeis who wrote, we are not won by arguments that we can analyze, but by tone and temper, by manner, which is man himself. I have had over a thousand young lawyers work for me. At one point, I had 57 lawyers working for me, 21 of whom graduated one or two in their class from the best law schools in America. But there was a difference. There was a difference. They were all ambitious. But some rationalized a lot. For if you work in the service of what matters to you, as Bo said, if you're guardians of the more complicated truth, not only society, but you will be better off for it. I'm not asking for any great sacrifice. I'm not asking for sackcloth, ashes, not making money. You can do both and we'll all be better off. And my wish for you, the graduating class of 2016, is that you're both so successful, but even more importantly, that you're happy in the pursuit of your ambition. Congratulations, class of 2016. I'm proud of you. I'm proud to stand among you as fellow alums. May God bless you, and may God protect our troops. Thank you.